is just laid out before me like a land that God has blessed. And you know, God has blessed. And I'm thankful that God has blessed this land. I'm thankful that today I can look at the weather and say, hey, this morning when we got up at sunrise, it was snowing. At 10 o'clock, it was kind of cloudy and cold, almost rainy. By noon, the sun was breaking. Looked like the storm was coming our way, and then the wind shifted around again. The wind blowing through their wheel, you didn't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So too with the weather, especially in the rough of the month of The wind is blowing in my face, which means that it's coming slightly from the north, slightly from the west. And that kind of means that maybe a front's still coming. Maybe we still got snow in the forecast. Maybe the wind blows with her will. You don't know what's coming or what's going. I like that idea because even though they predict the weather, you never know what you're going to get until you get there. Now, I've been doing this for a little while now, and I've begun to appreciate and to be thankful so much so for being here in this place to share the word of God, to talk about Jesus, to relate and to give information about how to study the word of God or the Bible for it to become the word of God so that you can know Jesus in a personal and intimate way. That is what we do at Pinnacle Church. We believe that it's the word of God by the spirit of God to the people of God and the son of God, Jesus. And if it isn't about Jesus, well, we really don't get involved. Because you know there's lots of religious ideas. There's lots of religious rules and regulations, and God bless them for those. I personally support any religious idea you might have for you. Now, don't tell me your religious idea and then make me do it, but for you, if that works for you, hey, you and God, go be blessed. But you see, I like to follow what Jesus said, so I like to listen to His words, I like to obey what He has to say. And that's why we study the Gospel of John right now. We're studying the Gospel of John because John was personally involved with Jesus. John walked with Jesus. John talked with Jesus. You could say John knew Jesus very intimately. We are talking about John who wrote the book of John or the Gospel of John. We're talking about John who wrote 1 John. We're talking about John who later in his life actually coined or written or put to words that was which God told him to write down in the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. I think John has a pretty good handle on who Jesus is. I think John knows Jesus and Jesus knows John. Do you? Do you know Jesus? If you want to know Jesus, then I would recommend John. If you want to know about Jesus, then I recommend your religious ideas. Because you see, there's a lot of people that say, what would Jesus do? And I always look at him and say, well, go ask him. What's the matter with you? <laughs> so what would Jesus do? He'd answer you. That's what Jesus would do. I mean, after all, it does say in the Bible, the word of God, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who created God to give it to him. Jesus said himself that, hey, don't think that I'm the only one that gets to talk to God this way. You too can be like me. He spoke so much so that he said, I want you to be as one as I am one with my father. Now, I'm pretty amazed by that because most people will say, well, yeah, we'll take that as far as going into our church to be one. And they'll be one with each other. But I want to be one with God. No offense to you, but, you know, you're kind of easy to get along with as long as you get what you want. But being one with God, being one with His Father, being one with the Son, whoa, if I start there, I guess by the time I get to you, it'd be fine. But if I start with you, we'll settle for less. Now, whoa. So what we want to do here is we want to give you the best. Don't want to lay some religious trip. Don't want to speak some doctrine or dogma. Don't want to make 
think it's theologically correct or intellectually perspective or, you know, in some way, some educational idiot that you think that you know what you're doing when God says, look, most of what your education is going to do is make you realize you need me. That even as easy as it is for a little child to follow a father, that's what you've got to become when you follow me. Suffer the little children, Jesus said, to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And a little child believes what they're told. A little child will follow the love. A little child will go after what a person says, come to me. That child will come. Now, I'll admit, in our society, it's a little nerve-wracking. There's certain nervous situations that you don't want your children to find themselves in. But in the olden days, when I was a child, and still in a lot of neighborhoods, you could say, come to me, and you could talk to a child, and the child would talk, and you'd learn something from that child. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that a little child shall lead them. Because, you see, in these latter days, children are learning faster than the adults are. They are internet ready, they are internet related, and they are learning off of the internet. I got news for you, that's what video church is. We are internet based. We exist so that we can assemble ourselves together, but we relate Jesus in a personal and intimate way through video. Through video.org, through video church, through everything that's related to the word B I D D E V O. We are video. And we share Jesus as we have learned from Him and know Him in a personal and intimate way. And today, what we're studying, as we've been studying in the sunrise service, as we've been studying at the 10 o'clock service, and as we're studying now at the 2 o'clock service, is John chapter 1, verse 6. So let's turn there. you got a Bible, look there. If you've got prayer, pray there. If you've got the Spirit, then listen there. Whatever it is that God is doing in your life, then let's be there and hear what God has to say to us. Now, I like John chapter 1. It's interesting because it starts off kind of metaphysical, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's pretty metaphysical to me. It kind of appeals to my hippie side. But it's also mystical. And in that mysticism that John had studied and learned from being there in Jerusalem, being one of those who had been sent, as we're going to read today about another John episode, John was sent to Jerusalem to learn some of the things that he knew spiritually, that he incorporated intellectually, and became a part of his life personally after he came into contact with Jesus. Prior to that, he was a son of thunder. Afterwards, he became the beloved disciple. John became a pacifist, not an activist. So in John chapter 1, verse 6, we read, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now this John that we're talking about is John the Baptist. Now if you want to know an activist, that's John the Baptist. John the Baptist, Jesus said, was a prophet of God, and that of women that were, of men that were born of women, there was no one greater than John the Baptist. He was an activist in the sense that he cried out in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. He was an activist in the sense that he prepared people for the coming of Jesus. And he told them to repent and be baptized. And they came unto him and were baptized. He didn't require them to go to a special class of baptism. He didn't ask them 20 questions in order to get baptized. He simply said, come unto me and repent and be baptized. And so they were baptized. And that's really the way we ought to all be about baptism. You see, baptism is just an outward sign of an inward change. It's something you want to demonstrate to the world that you're going to do. You're making a promise before God and angels that you're going to die to yourself and rise unto God. That's what baptism represents, a death of a kind. That you are submerged under the water. And I don't care if you're sprinkled or dinkled or, you know, dripped or whipped or whatever it was that you were done in water. It works. It's just a symbol. It's not something you have to have for salvation. It's not something that makes you saved. It's something you do because you're saved. It's just something you get to say, hey, I'm going to show people and demonstrate to them, not that I know how to pray, but that I am being baptized. I'm making an hour an hour profession of an inward change. I am declaring that I am dead with Christ, but I am risen with Him in the promise of new life. And one day, that baptism will prepare you for the day you will die. 
because this corruption that is, or this body that is sown in corruption will be raised in incorruption. That this mortality will be raised in immortality. That when you are baptized, you will go down and come back up with the promise of eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you have that life. It's been promised you. It's been given to you. All you need to do is ask for it. All you need to do is receive it. Jesus said, come unto me and I won't cast you out. Ask for forgiveness and I won't reject you. I got news for you. Anybody, whether they're in ISIS or whether they're in a church or a steeple, people young and old, people tall and short, people of any race, kind, guilt, or color, can be saved. Anyone can be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to the world. Not anyone that particularly has to do something first. You don't have to follow the you know, Ten Commandments of Sinner's Prayer. You don't have to know everything there is to know about why God died. You don't even have to know everything there is about sanctification, specification, doctrination. Well, you know, all the Asians. All you got to know is that you need to be saved. You want Jesus and you say, God, save me. I want you. And God will come to you. You see, that's kind of the message that John was preaching. He was telling them, look, there's another one that's coming that's greater than I am. And he will baptize you with fire. And he won't only come to, he won't only come to save the nation. He will come to save the world. And my ministry, my life, my worth is not even worthy to be considered next to him. I'm not worthy to even untie his sandals. And behold, Jesus came as the Lamb of God to be slain for the foundation of the world. As John prophesied, as John, the beloved disciple, watched and saw this man approach John the Baptist. And so we read in John chapter 6 that John was sent by God. We read in John, or verse 6, we read in John chapter 1 verse 6 that his name was John and that he was a man sent from God. And I like that because that same word that's for man can be messenger. That same word for being sent by God also means missionary. That same word and idea of having been sent by God Almighty means that you in like manner are likened unto apostles. You are likened unto missionaries. You are likened unto someone who has been sent out in order to do the work that God has told you to do. Now I like that because that's what we talked about at the 10 o'clock service. Now that we're at the 2 o'clock service, all I want to know is, if you're sent, what are you doing? What are you doing? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. You know, John got his name by an interesting way of uh, circumstance. There's an old man an old woman. Yeah, you know, they were probably kicking back, rocking into rocket chairs, you know. They weren't quite as old as maybe Abraham and Sarah when they had their kid. They were getting up there in years, you know, and they were considered the ostracized of the community. They were considered not quite right because they didn't have kids. You see, in the day that was born of Jesus at the time that he came into the world, it was considered a curse of God. You're cursed to not have much fruit. And that fruit was considered children, man and woman. In other words, if you didn't have any kids, if you were running around populating the earth, you were cursed of God. You were a barren tree. You were a fruitless womb. You were like clouds that passed by and didn't rain or snow. You were considered not blessed by God. So here we have this couple that, hey, you know, unfortunately they're getting a little old, you know, and even though he's a Levite, he's cursed to God because he hasn't had kids. So all of a sudden, guess what happens? In the course of his duty, in the course of his work, as he's doing the things God had already told him to do, God sends an angel. God sends a messenger to Zechariah and says, look, you're going to have a kid. Really? <laughs> Good luck with that. Actually, because of where he was at, I imagine he listened rather than he considered. I imagine that he obeyed rather than he laughed at. I imagine being stuck there in the temple, doing the temple duties that he was of his order to do that day, he himself 
simply saw the angel and went, oh my God. And what would happen if you saw an angel? Hey, there are lots of people that have said they've seen angels. I know I've encountered angels. I know that it's interesting that there are different types of angels. I know there's a lot about angels. There are false angels that we call demons. There are good angels, or we should say just angelic beings that are godly, that are those that did not rebel against God and His commandments, that didn't follow Satan. And we know that they are there for a purpose and a messenger that is sent unto us. So John's father was sent a messenger. And the message was given unto him that he should have a son and eventually when it came time that his wife would have a baby, he would name his child John. And in order to fulfill a prophecy and to not mess anything up, what John was told by the angel was that he'd be struck and dumb. He could not speak. He could not relate the information. He couldn't tell anyone anything until that moment when John would be born. And prophesied as it was, sure enough, when John, when Zechariah came out of the temple after doing his duties, they saw his face. They saw the fact that he couldn't speak. They realized a miracle had happened. And unfortunately, being a childless man, on the one hand, they knew that he experienced a miracle. On the other hand, how they interpreted that, it's debatable. Because you see, when Mary left to go into the hill country to be found with child, she was embarrassed that, you know, she didn't want to be stoned in her own community. She went in a faraway place. She went to her relative, Elizabeth, Zechariah Elizabeth. That was having a baby. I think I messed that up in the earlier service. Now I'm going back in my mind. I'm going, did I say Elizabeth? Or did I say... I'm not sure who I said. But the point being, Zechariah's wife, having been impregnated by God and man and woman. And let's talk about that for a moment. Think about this for a moment. If God, by the Holy Spirit, could form a body so that Jesus could inhabit it and be fully human and fully God, do you really think that you're God-like because you can have babies? Do you really think that God isn't involved in procreation? You know, P-R-O-C-R-E-A-T-I-O-N. Do you really think that it's just sperm and egg and that's it? That it's just an animistic reaction to the interjection of so many chromosomes on one side and so many chromosomes on the other and then the mitigation of the cells come together and they form a life and that's how life is born? I got news for you. You're stupid. Did you ever read a Bible? You did? Really? Did you see in Genesis chapter 1 where it says, God formed man out of the dust and breathed into him the breath of life. How do you think life begins? It begins when God writes your name in the book of life. But besides that in heaven, it begins when God breathes life into a sperm and an egg that have gestated. That have become that moment when God breathes life into them to become a living soul. That's when life begins. Don't forget it. Don't mess it up. It's right there in the scripture. Genesis chapter 1. Read it. I mean, come on now. You ought to know that. You ought to think that. It doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. If you think you're gods because you have children, then I got news for you. Go out and be gods. You'll die like men. But the living God, the living creator of the universe, participates as the third party in every relationship. There are three parts to a marriage. God, man, and woman. Don't forget that because there's three parts to everything in life. Whether you look at it, it is said that the, even the Godhead is repeated nature. So the reality of what life begins at is when God breathes life into that living soul, or that being, and it becomes a living soul, into that physicality of the gestation of the cells becoming that with which they're meant to be, and that God had programmed in the law of order, or in the order of law, or in order, or in Seder, that God had laid out at creation when he said be fruitful and multiply hey he still is personally involved in every single moment of that world got news for you god knows every hair on your head and god is involved in every moment every aspect every reality that's when life begins 
you'll mess it up. Don't get involved in all these creationists versus, you know, evolutionists and all these stupid arguments. They don't even go back to the Bible to argue their debate, to debate their point. They don't find themselves in the Word of God for it. They find themselves using the Bible in order to prove a point. They are scientific in some ways, but they are demonstrative in the realization that knowing that God is involved in every part of your life, even as He's involved in every God and little of the Word of God. That's why the Bible is not just a book, but it's the Word of God, it's the Spirit of God, it's the wisdom of God in order to understand God. Otherwise, you have no understanding. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing at all. But if you ask God, God will give you understanding. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask for God who agreed with God to give it to all men liberal. And so it was at the appointed time that it was prophesied that his name would be called John. Now, I like John because I find there are a lot of Johns in my life. There's John, you know, one of the rooms that I go to, that's a John. Oh, okay, never mind. That's not a John, that's whatever it is. Restroom? Well, no, they don't rest in there either. I don't know what they do in there, but they get cleaned up. God speaks to me in the bathroom, so I guess I kind of like it because I lay down in the bathtub, turn on the hot water, and kick back with my Bible or my devotional, and woohoo! I'm in heaven. And then all of a sudden, God says, yes, you are. And I go, oh, no, <laughs> don't look, God. God don't care. So the fact of the matter is, this man sent by God, John, they were reading about in chapter 1 of verse 6. He is an interesting being and person that fulfills what God had told him to do. He literally loses in one aspect. At the end of his life, he kind of loses hope. He kind of loses his way. He gets off center. He gets off kilter just a little bit like any man will. And he begins to think maybe his Jesus isn't who he said he was supposed to proclaim before he came. Maybe this Jesus isn't the one who will baptize with fire. Maybe I don't understand everything there is about John the Baptist, or about the message I was given. And you know, that's kind of where we're at today. We all have an idea of what we think we know. We all have an idea of how we think it'll play out. And then we all have an idea of how we think that it's going to happen. It's kind of like when I got up today. I saw the weather reports. I saw the sky. I saw the clouds. I had the rain coming down. I had the snow falling down. And now, before I started this service just now at 2 o'clock, I had sunshine. Bright sunshine that was warm. Only now it's getting cold. The wind has shifted directly from the north. And it feels cold. I know that there's a storm coming. And I know eventually I'm going to lose the light. I'm going to lose the weather, and it's going to get really chilly. So then I'm going to put back on all my winter gear. But for now, at this moment in time, guess what? I know that God caused it to shine so that I would be blessed to know that now. And that's kind of what it is with John. John didn't realize that God was with him, that God was preparing him, and that God was going to show him how he would die. And it happened. Sure enough, sure enough, at the moment of after asking to send one of his disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the one? Shortly after that, John died. You're going to die. One way or another, you're going to die. You're either going to die to your selfishness, you're going to die to your sinfulness, and you're going to be raised up by either rapture or resurrection unto a new life. You're going to be raised up, be living into eternity in a place where there's perfection and holiness and kindness and gentleness and meekness and temperance. There is no violence. I got news for you. Violence is corruption, and if you're a violent man, you need to repent. You need to learn a lesson from John the Baptist and say, hey, you know what? I need to repent and be baptized. I need to see a better way. I need to follow Jesus today, not John the Baptist. You know, we talked about following John the Baptist at the 10 o'clock service and how that is one way of getting away with being an activist. You want to, you know, follow political activism? Fine, be like John the Baptist. You want to follow after, oh, I don't know, social causes? Be like John the Baptist. You want to follow legal precedent and laws? Be like John the Baptist. Jesus said no greater man 
with that word of a woman than John the Baptist. And so it was. That's what John the Baptist was like. He was very involved in all these things that you and I get involved in today, don't we? We involve ourselves in lots of activism. We involve ourselves in lots of other situations and circumstances. We involve ourselves in every other thing except for proclaiming that Jesus is coming. You know why? Because we don't want Jesus to come. We would rather have our grandchildren grow up and grow old. We would rather have the world fall apart and go to pieces, but we want to have our pie and our cake and our Thanksgiving and our Christmas. And by the way, Jesus, can you make it another year and another year and another year? It's getting bad out there, folks. You don't want Jesus to wait. You want him to come sooner than you think. You want him to come as soon as possible. You should be praying, oh, God, send Jesus now. As a matter of fact, that ought to be our prayer, really. Hosanna, save us now. Hoshana, save us now. At the time that Jesus came, that John was baptizing in the river Jordan, the world looked like it was coming to an end for the Jews. They wanted to cast off the Roman Empire. And little did they know Jesus was going to warn them that, look, don't wait for me as he was warning the women in Jerusalem when he was marching to the cross to die, bearing his own cross. He said, wait for yourselves. If they're doing this now when it's not so bad, just think what it's going to be soon. And sure enough, by 70 AD, they were weeping for themselves because in fact it matter. All of Jerusalem was devastated and destroyed, not only by the Roman Empire, by the Roman army, but by fire. As a matter of fact, it came upon them in such a way that the destruction was reported for us and it's devastating. It's amazing that a people could survive that. What are you doing? Now see it. I kind of know what John the Baptist was doing. He was sent by God. But what are you doing? Are you sent somewhere to do something? Have you forgotten to do what Jesus told you to do? Have you forgotten that you're not John the Baptist, but that you are in fact a follower of Jesus? You see, John, the disciple of Jesus, was a follower of John the Baptist. And he could have stayed there. He could have remained an activist and been to John and John lost his head. Matter of fact, I'm sure a lot of John's disciples lost their head and their mind because they didn't know that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them and they would be restored of all the things that Jesus had said because they loved John so much because John was a manly man. John was a man after man's own heart. John was someone who was doing the will of God, but he was someone you could look at and say, I want to be like him. He's rough. He's tough. He's got a hairy chest. He's got camel's hair. He's wild locust and honey. He shouts down the scribes and the Pharisees. He argues. He debates. He's one of those that doesn't take anything. He stands up for the nation. And yet, God took his head. Yeah, God did it. God allowed it. So God did it in some ways. Because it's never going to solve the issue by doing that with which God sent you to do unless it involves Jesus. You see, John was only there to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to prepare the way of the Lord. That Jesus would come and he would fulfill the destiny that he was meant to do, to die for the sins of the world and be raised from the dead. So that we would be likened unto him and we would die for our faith. Not go out and try to kill people in the name of God, but rather die for the enemies of God so that they would live. Because we have a destiny that we live in eternity forever and ever and ever and ever. And knowing that, we have no fear of death. So we ought to give more excellent attention to that with which God had told us to do. He has sent us as he sent John. But he has sent us as he has sent Jesus. Now, what are you doing? Are you willing to go and do what Jesus has told you to do? I see a deer right across the street. It's got, oh, I don't know, maybe four... Uh, three prongs, two prongs. And I'm in the middle of the city. And that deer is running across the basketball court. I think it's amazing. As a deer pants before the water, so my soul along with that thing. Are you considering these things and doing them? Are you recognizing the signs of the times? Are you paying attention to what God has chosen you to do? Are you a man sent from God? You can be. Just ask. 
Ask God to send you. Maybe God has sent you. Ask God to renew you. Maybe God's renewed you. Ask God to fill you. Maybe God's filled you. Ask God to bless you. Ask God what He wants you to do today, and you'll find God has something for you to do because God wants to send you every day, like John the Baptist, out to do what Jesus has told you to do, not what John the Baptist did. But you'll lose your hope in the end. But Jesus fulfilled his destiny, and Jesus brought light into the world. He brought hope, and he brought that with which God said would accomplish in his life, and in his death, and in his resurrection. And that is salvation to anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. That is what you are called to do. You have been chosen, you have been sent, and you are to be a little Jesus. You are meant to go out and be the kind of Jesus that only you can be because you've got your personality. You get it? Only you can be the Jesus you're meant to be because the way you are is the way you is. The way you is is the way you are. And what you are is what God is inside you. God is sending you. God will use you. God will fill you. God will bless you. And God wants you to go. So what are you waiting for? Great invitation. He's already done that. Are you waiting for God to command you? He's already done that. Are you waiting for God to say something? He's already done that. 